Well, good morning. Good morning. Wow, that sounds amazing. I'm going to try that again just because it's awesome. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's even better. This is great. I, I'm going to introduce myself in case y'all don't know me. My name is Stephen Mitchell. I'm the campus pastor for the East Campus, and, and we get to come and worship together. Sometimes they let us out of the box. And we get to come and participate and worship together. And it's just awesome to be able to be here together as a community, right? It's good for us to be able to celebrate this God that is doing so much in this community. And I'm excited because I get to talk about some of the cool stuff that God is doing. And I get to share some of the cool stuff that God is doing at the East Campus. And, and we're talking about this in this sermon series that's called uh, Shipwrecked. And if you, if you haven't been here for a couple of weeks, I, I'm going to just encourage you to go online. I'm going to give a quick recap of the stuff that we've been talking about, but it's awesome. Uh, it, it is, it is, uh, we're stealing the idea of shipwrecked, actually, because it's a great idea from Vacation Bible School. So if you're not familiar with the church, Vacation Bible School is the opportunity that kids have to come here in a couple of weeks and they get to sing songs and they get to hear stories and they get to do all kinds of fun activities. And really they kind of just take over the church. And it's amazing to watch because there's gonna be about uh, almost 500 kids that are gonna be coming here to learn and grow in relationship with one another and in relationship with God. And it's so cool that we, we decided the, their, their idea of shipwrecked is what we're gonna, we're gonna take, we're gonna liberate that just from them so that we can all be a part of it, so that the community can celebrate this whole idea. And so our, our idea is that we need God to rescue us from, from when we shipwreck ourselves and maybe he can help us in not being shipwrecked uh, by, by giving us some advice or, or ways to live, showing us by the presence of his Holy Spirit how we can live differently. And so Pastor Keith started us off, and he was talking about how we're like icebergs, right? Only 10% is visible. The, the 90% we keep kind of below the surface, and we're looking for um, the, uh, we need to look to allow God to get into that 90%, because that's really where we live, and we live out of that. And we need, we need Christ to come in there and help to reorder our lives and organize our lives and get us in the right place with him. And then last week, Pastor Jennifer did a great job with sitting citizenship, talking about how we need to really be citizens of heaven and focus on God and God's reign on earth and be in the world, but not of the world. And this week, we're going to continue this series, and we're going to be talking about relationship. And the reason that we're talking about relationship is because I think, quite frankly, if, if you're anything like me, you get relationship wrong. You, you try to do it. You have a tendency to want to do it all on your own. And that's, that's where things kind of fall apart for me as a person. And, and maybe you've experienced the same thing. Uh, as an example, I, I was moving from one house to another. And the basement, it was a ranch. And so the basement is where the laundry room was. And so I, was, I, I had planned for friends to come over and help me move. And they were going to show up and, in about an hour. And so I was doing the pre-work, right? So I went down to the basement. And I was disconnecting the washer and the dryer. And I had moved all the light stuff already, but the heavy stuff is what was left. And so I had called in my, my, my buddies to come over and help me drag this stuff out to the, the truck. And so I thought to myself, self, and this is usually, if you're anything like me, this is where things go horribly wrong. And this is no, ex no, no exception. I thought, self, maybe I could do a little bit more. Maybe I could strap the, the washer to the dolly and I could take it out on my own. You know, because this is a great idea, because then, then my friends would get there, and everything would be upstairs, and they would applaud my Herculean effort to, to help them out, right? So I was, I, and really, I was doing it to be selfish. I was like, oh, I'm going to do this on my own, and then they will acknowledge that I have done this thing on my own, and so I, I, I strap the, the washer up, and I take it over, and, and it had like a little platform, and then it turned 90 degrees to the steps, and so I wheeled it over, and I went up that platform, and man, that was so easy, and then I turned it 90 degrees, and I was like, this is going to be so good, right? And so I, 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 I'm looking at the dryer and I notice that God is with me because there is about an inch of space 
between the dryer and the wall and the handrail. So I don't even have to take the handrail off. I'm just going to be able to go straight up this thing. It's not going to be a problem. I am so blessed. And so I go up, chunk, chunk, chunk. Like, like on the fourth step, I start to notice things are not quite as good as I had first imagined. And that is that the wall, maybe the wall, angled in, or the handrail angled in, but whichever was the case, the space was getting narrower and narrower. And I was having more and more difficulty getting the dryer up. And, and so instead of being an intelligent person, I chose to continue and do this on my own. And so I, I just decided, hey, there's only like four steps left. I'm just going to do it. There's no way it's going to get that small. So up the next step. And, and I started noticing just how hard this was getting. And, and so on the next step, I, I was going to have to put a little bit of force into it. And so I grabbed the dolly and I just hercules it into a wedged position between the wall and the handrail. And, and this is one of the spots that the handrail actually had the support, so there was no wiggle room at all. And so I'm stuck there. Now, here's the funny part is if I let go of the dryer, it would tumble down. So the top would go over the back, and it would tumble down the stairs. But I couldn't lift it up to move the back of the dryer out. I couldn't get it out of this position. And so I was, I, was, I mean, like, I looked really cool because I had my hand wrapped through the dolly. And I'm like calling my friends and being like, hey, when are y'all coming over? Uh, because I, I, I had like an hour left. And I'm sitting in the hallway uh, in the stairwell. And I'm thinking to myself, I am so dumb. If I had just waited for my friends, I, I would not be in this position. And so fortunately for me, about 20 minutes later, my son came home and he was able to like spider monkey between the bars and go down below it. And we were able to get it down without just plummeting down and smashing into the wall, which was glorious uh, because my dryer was good. But really the core of this whole story is that I thought to myself that I should do it myself and I didn't need any help to do this. Now, that, that's, I think, where we, we tend to go wrong as, as a community because we, we tend to withdraw from relationship. We tend to back off and, and try to do things on our own. And I don't think this is any new news to y'all. I think y'all have probably experienced this before. If any of you have, have kids, I can guarantee that you have heard uh, something similar to what my son used to say to me all the time. He would tell me this, and it helps if it works. There we go. Me do it, right? So I, I don't know if, if you are like me, but maybe, maybe my kids are the only ones that did this. But they want, to, they want to do it on their own. And so my son would do this over everything. If, if, I, if I'm trying to tie his shoe. He doesn't know how to tie shoes. It's okay. He's going to do it. He would say, me do it. Or bike riding. He wanted the, the, the training wheels off so early. And I'm like, man, this is a horrible idea. I picked that kid up so many times off of the floor because he wanted to do it himself. And so if you have kids, you've experienced this. But if you've been a kid, you've probably experienced this. And the truth is that as adults, we experience this more and more frequently than we'd like to admit where we think that we want to do, and I think, we, you know, Jesus thinks we're so cute. Oh, look, they're trying to do it all on their own, right? And, and, and that's kind of a difficult place for us. So my son really tried to focus on doing it himself, and, and we do the same thing, and perhaps you've tried to do it on your own. Maybe it was a marriage that, was, that, that you ha were in difficulty with and, and you're trying instead of seeking for others to come and, and, and help walk alongside you and counseling and that type of thing, you're just trying to do it all by yourself and you're finding out it's more and more difficult and you feel more and more alone or a financial situation, because we don't like anybody in our business, and so you've entered into too many credit card agreements or whatever, and now your paycheck and, and the amount of money you need are growing further and further apart, and you're going deeper and deeper in debt, and instead of seeking a relationship with somebody that may be able to help counsel you, instead of seeking uh, some ideas on budgeting, and instead of gathering folks around you, you withdraw because, man, I don't want anybody to know that I have overextended myself. 
Maybe it's a spiritual journey. Maybe you, you think that, uh, hey, I can just find Jesus or find God in the wilderness. I can find him in the trees. And, and while that's cool to go and experience nature and experience God, God is found in community. And so you find yourself alone or more alone than you should be in relationship. Or maybe it's raising a kid. I don't know if y'all know this. I'm a, I'm a single parent. I've got two kids, my son and my daughter. My daughter, uh, there was no world where we weren't going to talk about this. My daughter just graduated high school. Uh, she, she is, yeah, that's, bring it on. I did that. That's me. <laughs> Right, we had the party, and my daughter thought it was hilarious because people kept coming up, up to me and saying, "Oh, congratulations!" And she was like, "You didn't do anything." I was like, "I made you," <laughs> and then I put you through school, so I did it all. So you may you may take a little credit for it, but I think, all joking aside, we tend to do that. We we take credit, and sometimes that's like the whole dryer idea or the washing washer and dryer idea that I wanted to take credit for doing something and see my friends notice me for doing it by myself. That, that I kind of want to take credit for this too. And the truth of the matter is, is if we're in relationship, we can, we can have a, a life-changing experience where we can see other folks coming alongside us and blessing us and helping us in relationship with God and relationship with others. And, and I think that's the, true, the truth of this whole shipwrecked idea that I've got is this. We shipwreck God's view of relationship when we believe we can do it all on our own, when we believe we can do it by ourselves. That's the core of this whole message. I just want you to realize that God didn't create us for that. We're, we're herd animals. I mean, if you, if you hear about somebody that's a hermit or, or somebody that lives all on an island all by themselves, that's a little weird, right? I mean, so that, that is the idea is because we, we recognize that we're meant to be together, that God puts us in community with one another. Now, the Bible tells us just this. The Bible tells us that, that we're designed to be in community and in relationship. And it, it starts off in the Old Testament. So the Bible is made up of two testaments with a lot of books in both. The Old Testament is the story up until Jesus. And the New Testament is the story from, of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and the early church. And so in the Old Testament, where we start today, we see exactly that, that God is seeking for us to be in relationship. And it, it's so early on in the story that it's found in the very first book, the book of Genesis. And the, the, the story of Genesis, the first two chapters, is this love story that God has on how God is going to embrace creation. And it's this theological, beautiful narrative of, of what creation looks like and how God goes about it. And what you'll notice is everything that God does, God looks at and says, it is good. So God created the heavens and the earth, and it is good. God created day and night, and it is good. God created, and it was good. But there was one thing that wasn't good, and that was that God created, and I'm going to click it again, and it's actually... All right, Spence. I don't know what I did. There it is. Thank you. God created Adam, and, and, and Adam didn't have a partner. Adam didn't have anyone that he could be in relationship with. And so God says it's not good because Adam needs Eve, and Eve needs Adam to be in relationship with one another so that they can hold each other up so that they can love one another and so that they can be in relationship with God. And, and what it works out like is this. God wants us to be in relationship with him, which is a, a relationship up, but God also wants us to be in a relationship out, in a relationship with one another. And, and this isn't just in Genesis. You look through the entire Bible and you will see community after community, relationship after relationship, because God longs for us to be in relationship with him and in relationship with the body so that we can go into the world and be in relationship with everyone. And so what, what does the New Testament say about this? Maybe, maybe Jesus says something different. Maybe Jesus does something different. And what we see actually in the New Testament is exactly this. So here is, here is God, the created son as Jesus, walking amongst us, and, and the very first thing he does when he starts his earthly ministry is not go out and do it on his own, but bring together a group, a community 
that they can live together and they can grow together and they can follow one another's lead. And so Jesus teaches and preaches and, and is doing miracles and people are seeing some amazing stuff and people are like, wow, this is, this is different from everything we've ever seen. And the, the core of it is that they are witnessing this community grow and develop And so Jesus puts together these 12 disciples. These are the the cream of the crop, the folks that he says, oh, you guys are going to be great. And by cream of the crop, I mean fishermen and tax collectors and folks that weren't really what everybody else would consider the cream of the crop. But Jesus brought them around him in a community. And our story that we're going to read from from the New Testament is it, it comes at the time when Jesus has brought the disciples together and they've seen Jesus doing ministry, but they've never gone out and done ministry with Jesus. They've not been a part of that. And so what we, what we come to is we come to this story in the gospel of Mark. And Mark, Mark is this guy that came to faith afterwards, uh, after Jesus was already raised from the dead. And Mark hears these stories and puts them down into, into this, this gospel, which is the story of Jesus' life. And we're going to, oh, you already did that. Ta-da. So, so the, story, the story goes like this. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. Now, I don't know if you caught that. He sent them out two by two because he wanted them to recognize that it's not you. I'm not sending you to this town and you to that town. You need to go together because you're already in community and without going together, you're not gonna be able to build each other up, you're not gonna be able to keep each other on the right path, and you're not gonna be able to celebrate the victories together. And so, so God sends them out through, through the communities around and, and sends them into those places. And then he says this, th- these were his instructions, Jesus is talking to the disciples. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. Now this does not seem like a normal set of marching orders to me. If I'm going to go on a trip, I'm going to at least take my wallet because I'm going to need to pay for something. So something else has to be going on here. Something deeper has to be at work. And I think the deeper message for this is that Jesus is saying, I want you to rely on one another as a community, and I want you to rely on God. Don't rely on money. Don't rely on an extra shirt. Don't rely on sandals. Rely on God. Now, if you're like me, and you're standing outside, a couple of days ago when it was super hot, I was out watering my grass. Now, if if a couple of guys come walking with sticks and sandals, my first inclination is probably not going to be like, hey guys, would y'all like to stay with me? It's going to probably be more like, what, what is going on with these guys? Now maybe y'all are better than me, maybe y'all aren't thinking the same thing, and y'all would invite them in, but that's exactly what happened. The disciples went out two by two, and they were invited into people's homes and into people's communities because God had already been at work in those homes and communities, and they were preaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. They, they went out and preached that people should repent. This is not a great message. This isn't an uplifting message. This is a, you're broken, you need to turn away from that, and you need to repent. And they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil, and they healed them. And they started to see something else that was phenomenal. Not only were they supposed to rely on God, but God showed up. God showed up in a big and powerful way. As a matter of fact, shortly after this, in the, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus sends out more folks. He sends out 72 other people. And they go out and they experience the same exact thing with the same exact marching orders. And when they come back together, they are so excited. They are excited because they've seen the people's lives change, but they've also experienced the presence and power of Jesus and they've experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit in the ministry. I mean, they're casting out demons, and they're super excited about it. And, and what happened is they started to come alive in community. So the community has been put around them, and Jesus has given them their marching orders, and they're together on the same mission, and they're holding each other up, and they're experiencing the presence of God, and they're seeing all of the things that God is doing. And now, now, 
they get excited about this mission and this goal that Jesus has. And they're, this is before the Holy Spirit has been given to us. This is before Jesus' death and resurrection. And so these folks are just excited about the things that they've seen and they haven't received the power or the presence of the Holy Spirit yet. And so we stand here today, or sit, as the case may be, and we see that Jesus put people around him knowing that he couldn't do it on his own. And we see that he didn't expect the disciples to do it on, our own, on their own. And yet, far too often, we believe we should do it on our own. And I think that's where the difficulty comes in because God has put this community of faith around us and God has invited us into this relationship. And if Jesus didn't try to do it on, our, on his own, why would we try to do it on our own? That's what Morningstar is about. Morningstar is a church that's designed not just so that we can come here and have a good time on Sundays or Saturday nights. It's a church designed so that we can come here and that we can grow together as a community so that we can go into the world and talk about Jesus transforming love and relationship. So that we can do this not one, one by one, but as a community together. So that we can go two by two into the world and make a difference. We talk all the time about going after the, the one the one that does not know God, the one that's far from God. And that's exactly what we're doing at the East Campus as well as this campus. If you're not familiar, we, we have two campuses. The East Campus meets in St. Peter's, Missouri. It's at the Cultural Arts Center in St. Peter's. And it, it looks a whole lot like this. Um, that's a very handsome man right there because that's me. Um, it's not the same shirt, although it looks like the same shirt. I have more than one shirt. Um, anyway, this is, this, is what, this is what it looks like. And, and we're a small community. We're a small group of folks that is trying to do something. And what happened was Pastor Mike had this understanding of we need to grow and we need to multiply. And so we're going to multiply by planting a new campus with the same mission, the same vision, the same church in St. Peter's. And we're going to send people out. And the reason that we did that is because geographically we have a set, an area that we can impact right here at Darden. But if we expand that, then we're making a bigger footprint for Jesus Christ. We're building a bigger kingdom. We were told to do two things by Pastor Mike. He said, he said I want you to do worship well. We're doing worship well. You got a, you got a little sample of, of some of that today. And then he said the second thing, I want you to build community because community is what it's all about. And so we, we have this community of faith that comes together and, and we have seen some folks that would never step foot in here either because it's geographically too far for them or because it's just outside of what they would hear about. And uh, there's a girl that showed up and she showed up and, and I was preaching and, and, and she vanished the next week and so I thought, I really did a horrible job. Y'all might be agreeing with her right now. But that wasn't the case. What happened was she heard a sermon about how we need a Savior, how Jesus needs to be in our lives. And, and what she heard changed her life to the point that she was like, I've got to get some stuff right with me. She went into, uh, into a rehab facility so that she could, she could get cleaned up. And then when I saw her again, she came to me and we, we sat down and we had some coffee and we were talking about stuff. And she was like, I'm going to be honest. I don't know anything about the church. And when y'all read from the Bible or y'all talk about the Bible, I don't even know what's going on with it. Y'all are using words that I don't understand. And I was like, I would love I would love for you to come and talk to me because I would love, there is nothing more that I would love than to explain what, I'm, what we're talking about or, or help you to understand more clearly what Jesus is doing because that's what community does. That's what we do as a community as we surround one another. We've got another friend, Pastor Mike talked about her a while ago. Her mom was hit by a car. And it was, it was brutal, and, and, and things were bad, and the, the doctors keep saying, hey, not, things are not good, things are not good, things are not good. And we surrounded her and her family as a community. Uh, the church came around her and said, you know what, we're, we're, we're not going to be okay with, with you going through this on your own. We're going to rally around you, and we're going to do things like, I don't know, pay for gas cards, bring magazines, bring food up. Whatever we can do, we're going to surround you so that we can be a part of this with you. Now, it's not our mom that's in the hospital, but we love you, 
and we love her, and so we're going to be present with you. And that's what the church is all about. That's what community is all about, and that's why God gives us these relationships, so that we can come alive as a community of faith and seek after what God is doing and try and grow in that relationship. And, and here's, here's the deal. Earlier I said I'm a single dad. Um, and, and being a single parent is, is difficult, especially when you have a girl, right, and you're a dad. So there are conversations that I wasn't super excited about when she was little. And so I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to put together a group of ladies that were, that were godly, uh, godly-centered women that would come alongside her and help her when, when there were conversations that need to be had or when her outsides felt like, our insides felt like they wanted to be on the outside because I'm, I'm just not built to deal with that conversation for obvious reasons. And so I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And, and so what I did is I, I built this community around my, my daughter and it went above and beyond what I ever expected. Here's what I mean. They, the women showed up in my house and they said uh, what I was doing was not right because my house was a bachelor pad and my daughter was going into middle school and they said, your daughter needs something a little different. We're gonna give her uh, a room makeover. We're gonna paint it. We're gonna change the drapes out. We're gonna make it look like a young woman's room instead of the Disney cartoon stuff that she's got because she deserves that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, are you, you don't like my decorating style, right? I'm, I'm a little offended until I realize that it's their love for my daughter and their relationship with my daughter that is the core of what they're doing. It's not about me at this point. It is about my daughter. And so I step, step back and I said, you know, knock yourselves out. If there's anything that I can buy, anything that I can do, I'm glad to do it. And, and, and she was so overwhelmed and overjoyed and appreciated it. And that's what community does. Community comes around when there's difficulty. Community comes around when we celebrate the things that God is doing. And community comes around, quite frankly, because they're almost family. And, and that's exactly what we're after in the church. We want a community of faith that drives us so into life that our day-to-day -day job is not just, hey, we've gotta go and, and do whatever X, Y, or Z we do. It's instead, our day-to-day -day job becomes a mission field where we can go and share the love of Jesus Christ with people that we know that are far from God so that we can go and love on folks that are hard to even relate to, so that we can go and care about people that don't look like us, don't sound like us, don't have the same socioeconomic background as us, don't have any of the same things that we do, because that's what Jesus called us to do. And that's where we come alive. Now maybe you're sitting out there and you're, you're actually thinking, hey, I, I really need to get into, in, into community and I've, I've just been coming here and I'm, I really haven't had an opportunity to grow in community. And so I'm going to tell you a few ways that you can do that. And these are super simple ways. These aren't complex rocket surgery sort of ways. They're instead very easy things to do. The first is a connect card. I know this sounds like I'm being silly, but I, I mean that for sure, is the connect card allows us to know if you're here, but it also allows us to know if you're not here. And, and you can do this on the app or on the, the card that's in your bulletin, and, and then when the, the generosity baskets go by, you place that in there, and that helps us to know because I have heard time and again from people that have said, hey, the church never called when I wasn't there. And I would say, so did you fill out Connect Card? Did you let the church know when you were there so that we could understand when you're not? Because the truth of the matter is we, we want to be there for you. We want as a community of faith to be able to rally around, uh, around each of us and to step into the lives of those around us. And that's core to that. The other thing you can do is, is a pastor's chat. On June 6th, we're going to have a pastor's chat. It's going to be great because you get to come and you get to hear from pastors. That was supposed to be comical. Anyway, it's, a, it's an opportunity to come and, and hear from us. And it's not just us talking about ourselves. It's us talking about what, what Morningstar is about, where Morningstar is going, and where you can get involved in Morningstar because community is core. And the last is Celebrate Recovery. And... There it is. The, the reason that I bring Celebrate Recovery up is, is this is what happens on Thursday nights. You come in, you worship together as a community, and then you break up into small groups, 
And in those small groups, you form deeper and more lasting community. And those communities lift each other up. Those communities celebrate the victories. And those communities also are a rallying around folks when things aren't going right. And that's what relationship does. That's what relationship is all about. And we have the perfect example of relationship when we look at Jesus. Jesus came into this world when we were far from him, when we were doing things our own way and we wanted to live our own lives. Jesus comes in to rescue us and offers us not just himself, but offers us entry into the family of God. Jesus comes together at a table, much like this one, probably not as high, to be totally honest, but he comes together t with his community of faith and he says, hey, guys, I, I know things are, are, are about to get crazy, but I want you to be with me. And, and, and if you think about the folks that were at that table, if you think about the people that were there, every one of them was going to abandon Jesus. One of them was going to betray Jesus over to the authorities. And yet Jesus was right there with them. And Jesus offered to them grace. And that's what this table is all about. Jesus offers to us grace. And so in a minute, we're going to talk through what communion looks like and how we're going to do that. But, but one thing I want you to understand first and foremost is this is not Morningstar's table. Morningstar doesn't own communion. Morningstar just facilitates. It's not a United Methodist table. This is God's table. And God invites all who are, are seeking to grow in relationship. We, we ask that all you want to do, all, all we want you to do is to be ready to take one step closer to Jesus because God is, is right here waiting at the table. And we don't offer communion one person, only one person. So if I'm by myself, I don't do communion for me. We only offer communion in community. We come together to receive communion together as the body of Christ. Once we have heard the word, we respond with communion because communion is what it's all about. Communion gives us this growth and crazy communion, community. It's, it's the drawing together of the body. And so we're going to have a moment where we're going to come and, and people are going to come out and the ushers are going to talk to you about where to go and what to do. And if you have uh, any, any need any help with communion, if you just raise your hand, we'll have people come over and bring communion to you. And if you also um, have any gluten allergies or if you'd like sealed communion, that will be in the back. So let's prepare our hearts for the reality of what Jesus did. So Jesus, surrounded by folks that were going to betray him, knowing that none of them deserved it, and yet loving them anyway, he took bread gave thanks to God and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is for you. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts of Jesus Christ and the calling of community that you have placed upon us, we ask, Father, that you would pour your Holy Spirit out upon us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine, that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to all the earth until you come in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet. All honor and power and glory is yours now and forever, Almighty Father. Amen.